Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, I am going through a whole bunch of oil paintings that I've worked on in the past, that this one's dry. Um, I'm just doing experiments on them. I'm also experimenting with the new camera and seeing how the, the filming of these videos go. So with this one, this painting was done I believe with water soluble oils and it was done on a flat gesso board smooth gesso board so the experiment for this one being that it's bluish to pass a orange oxide transparent glaze over it and see how that affects it so this is by Rembrandt brand uh, this is PY42 and PR101. The PR101 is definitely that synthetic rust color. PY42, I'm not sure which yellow that is. I'm using Galkid. I'm applying it as a glaze over it. My last video, my last experiment was using um, asphaltium as the glaze and that did not want to go on well I'm not quite sure why I thought it had something to do with the transparent properties of it but this one is going on pretty good See how it's changing it right before our eyes. It's also, um, I believe the Galkid can be used in this fashion as a way of what's called oiling out, which um, when I studied oils in college, I, we never really learned about that. Though the professor once cryptically alluded to it saying that you could take a mixture of, I guess he said turpentine and linseed oil and spread it on the painting and then it would be like painting on a fresh wet surface because we painted wet and wet in college anyhow um, where was I yeah, you could definitely see that PR 101 aspect to it it's like your light red oxide, your um, burnt sienna. What else are they making from that? I think Indian Red would have that in it. I think different brands vary, but PR 101 is very common. Anyway, so I wanted to see how this looked on top of kind of that complementary color underneath and we'll wipe back, rediscover our original painting. So the experiment here is tinting with the complementary color. And while I kind of just lift, I'm gonna blab for a moment. Uh, one person I thought of just now was Burge Har Harrison. I think it was Burge Harrison. He wrote a book in 1910, 1909. Really good oil painter. Um, fan of the tonalist movement. Uh, look him up on um, Google Images. Burge, B-I-R-G-E, Harrison. Um, and he talked about, it was a very like brief sections, the book. He mentioned the old masters, how the old masters would do an underpainting in a brown, and then paint on top of it. But then eventually, and this is hopefully I'm quoting him correctly, this is just a loose quote. He'd say that the old masters paintings, the brown would start to show through as they aged. Um, 
he talked then about another style of painting. I'm not sure if he talked about the Impressionist next, but then he talked about tonalism, which wasn't yet having a name to it. And hopefully somebody watching this can uh, knows what I'm talking about and will say in the comments below that he had said, you know, like a, the, the modern successful painters will paint an underpainting in a cool color and then paint a warm color on top of it or vice versa. Um, it was to get like a vibration and a, a relationship between the colors. And whether or not that is the true way to paint or not, I have no idea. Um, so I think some people will like really stick to their guns <laughs> with what they believe and say this is the absolute way to paint. Well, we know that like, you know, Rembrandt and other painters were fantastic. I mean, I really enjoy George Inez, a tonalist painter. Um, enjoy the works of Henry, Henry Whistler, but did they crack the code for the perfect way to paint? I can't imagine anybody could do that and if we narrow painting down we're all going to have our different formulas to it you know you're going to see the same patterns that I do with watercolor with oil painting etc but um I don't know I just don't think anything could be one size fits all I guess a great example would be oriental painting um, there's the ink painting and then there's the application of color on those, those paintings. And I'm sure that right there is probably a big argument. You know, should the color be there? Should the tonal variety and just the ink be sufficient? I'm sure there's whole schools of thought based around that. But don't get too caught up in things like that. You can think about those things while you paint. Challenge yourself. Help me find, find those dang Q-tips that are supposed to be around the house somewhere. Unless one of the cats took the whole box of Q-tips. That would be just... That would be something, wouldn't it? So... I'm going to stop the video in a few. Um, throughout, you should see the starting and the ending on the. Um, I think I'm going to. I put them in a different location for this one. I'm going to crop the video in. Hopefully, the painting hasn't moved around. I'm just painting flat on a paper towel since it's easier for me to film this way. But let me know what you think down below. Would you have kept it original? Or would you have done this experiment? Or what colors would you have glazed? What medium do you use to glaze? Ooh, the camera is accentuating this beautiful orange right here. And I want to accentuate that in the painting. Look at that fiery color in that sky. I don't even think I'm going to soften these strokes up. Well, there's something positive right there. Filming it and looking at through the um, the camera verse looking at it here let me bring that back to blue and get a glaze over that it's helping me see things a little bit differently it's kind of like standing up and be able to back away from the easel which you know I already explained why I'm painting flat
cool. All right, I think I'll leave this one at this. We might come back in a few days after it dries and play around with it, but um, I'll leave it there. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll talk to you soon.